I'm absolutely delighted as the director of the Water Institute in Dublin City University to have been invited to co-host this event, which um, is really up our alley. I mean, we, we've been running water cafes for four years now and uh, with a whole range of different topics and uh, speakers from all over the world. And this is even better because it has four speakers with different topics in one session. So it's going to be a real uh, joy. So um, without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and hand it over to our host, Brian Trench, on behalf of the Mary Mulvihill Association. Thanks very much, Fiona, and thank you very much for you having the Water Institute as, as part of this event. We did a similar event a year ago around the theme of virus, which was the theme of the Mary Mulvihill competition in that particular year. Uh, so this year, the theme uh, for this student competition is, is water. But the theme itself is intrinsically interesting. So whether or not this event stimulates further entries or ideas among the student uh, potential uh, competitors, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll all get something out of it. Uh, it's obviously too vast a subject to deal with comprehensively or even uh, anything close to that in one event or even one Fair publication. Enough. But we will hear various ideas and aspects and issues around water from our, our four speakers. There's somebody with uh, noise going on in the background. Would you mute yourself, please? Tommy. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm mute now. Thank you very much. Uh, I should say just that for those who don't know it, the Mary Mulville Association was set up uh, soon after the much too early death of Mary Mulvihill, the science communicator, writer, broadcaster, her ch champion of scientific heritage. Uh, she died in 2015 and we set up the association to commemorate her, to honor her legacy and to encourage a new generation of, of science communicators. And principally we've been doing that through the Mary Mulvihill Award which is now in its sex, sixth, excuse me, sixth offering. Um, uh, so the, those uh, entries will be coming in by the end of next month and will be judged in May with an event uh, to present the awards in June. Um, as I said earlier, if this event helps stimulate ideas or entries so much the better, but we'll go on with it uh, one way or the other approximately a half hour for the panel to talk among itself and for me to throw some ideas and, and questions at them and then another half hour for the wider discussion uh, and Fiona's keeping an eye on the uh, questions and comments that are coming in and we also are open to people making uh, contributions directly but perhaps you just wait to be called on uh, for that purpose. Uh, we'll, we'll start at the planetary level we may get to the molecular level and we'll get back out to the planetary level perhaps later again. But we'll start at the planetary level with uh, Neve Shaw, um, who has a, a background in engineering and in food science as a, a, as a doctorate in food science and did postdoctoral research in that. And about nearly 20 years ago, took a turn to acting and uh, to science communication. And she's done several solo shows, but she still hasn't got into space. She's dedicated to this. She will get there. Uh, we're all willing her uh, to get there. Neve, when an astronaut, or for that mm. matter, a cosmonaut, mm. looks back at Earth from space, do they see clearly that it is mainly water? And does it appear uniquely, therefore, in the solar system in that way? I think um, all of them say, which is really interesting, and I think water is an inherent part of that, they feel a familiarity first with it. It's like uh, I've interviewed many astronauts about this notion of this overview effect is like what effect does it have on them when they see the Earth from a distance? And the best way to describe it is, you know, the way I don't know if, if all of you are fortunate enough to to at least be aunties and uncles, if not parents, you know, that sense of familiarity that you have when you when you see a relative like a relative of your of your a child of your brother or your sister or even your own child you know that familiarity that's what they say they feel when they see the earth and 
earth is this beautiful kind of blue marble. And um, if I can share my screen, there's one picture that I go back to again and again, it's, which is what inspired me. Fiona, I don't know if you've given me screen sharing privileges, but if I can, I just need to share this one picture. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, Please I have. Ahead. Great, I have. Yeah, brilliant. This is this is it to me. This is it. This is what kicked off kicked off my obsession when I was eight years old, and this is the thing that kicked off the whole environmental movement in the late sixties. This is Earthrise. It was shared on Christmas Eve, nineteen sixty eight. We hadn't even gotten to the moon, and this is the picture that everybody realised how beautiful and how fragile and how unique our planet is. It's it's a picture taken on one of the missions that was in preparation for the first time we put humans on the moon. Um, uh, which was one of the Apollo missions. And uh, this was the first picture that the whole world saw of Earth in its entirety. It's called Earthrise because only half of the Earth is in light because it was showing that the sun was shining on this particular half. And if you look at that picture, it's, it's a dominant blue and white. And that's the foam of the sea and it's the blue of the water. So without doubt, every time an astronaut has the privilege or anybody, I mean, it's getting anybody can go up there now if they have a big enough bank account, but anybody that can see it can see that that our planet is predominantly made of water and they will talk about that. But actually, they'll talk about that in inherent connection and familiarity that they have when they see the Earth in its entirety, that we come from that and we are part of that. Now, there are other planets or celestial objects out there that are uh, composed dominantly of water one of the moons of, of saturn titan is seen to be like a pure yeah. pure ice but it's very difficult to find a planet that we can live on that has the the quantity of water that we have on earth and we should remember that and uh and take better care of it so does that answer your question brian it, it does. does and that that image will come back again uh, theo will have something possibly to say about okay. that image, i'll stop sharing uh, later now. on Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely to just to be reminded of it. Um, most much overused word iconic, but it certainly is iconic. Um, if what do you think the chances are that there is a planet in the solar system where there is an abundance of water that supports life? Oh my gosh, absolutely. But I mean, you know, we're such a small absolutely, species. absolutely, really. Well, why not? Why not? I mean, we keep thinking that we're this unique species, and I think it's our biggest failing as 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 an animal of this planet. We are we are effectively a parasite surviving on a planet that gives us everything, and we keep taking it for granted because we keep thinking we're in charge. We are not in charge, and the more we look out to the universe and we see, um, you know, with with more and more powerful telescopes. And most recently, we've launched a new telescope called the James Webb Telescope, which will help us even more understand our place in the universe. Uh, we are tiny in comparison to everything that's out there. You know, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is one of, of billions of galaxies that are out there. And the more we observe, uh, the more we see that there are, there are inevitably planets orbiting most stars, uh, not only in our galaxy, but in many, many galaxies. So... It's like uh, we have to keep getting an update on our prescription lenses in order to understand what we're seeing around us. So at the moment, uh, what we keep doing is we keep making assumptions. Uh, and certainly when I was in school, I was told that we were the only system of planets that orbited a star. And of course, now we know <laughs> that there are billions of planets orbiting stars. So what is the likelihood that there is water uh, on other planets? I would say, given the statistics of that, uh, I would say highly likely. Will we find it? Possibly. Uh, will we ever get there? Probably not, unless we get unless we figure out a very sophisticated systems to travel through this vast universe. So I think it's arrogant of us to think that there is only one planet with this amount of water. And I think um, what I find about space is a deeply humbling. Um, it's a deeply humbling discipline, but it certainly makes me realize that uh, we're very lucky to have what we have. Um, but the likelihood of it existing in some other galaxy somewhere else, I would say, is highly likely. But somebody will find it at some stage. And it'll be worth the investment of, of course, billions yeah. and billions and billions in space exploration to prove this. Yeah. Well, we spend more per year on our health uh, budget, you know, like the European Union spends more on its health budget than it does actually on, on its space program. So I think that the, the great thing about space is it challenges us to see ourselves differently. It challenges us to think about our relationship with our planet and it challenges us to find better solutions for energy and for and for water consumption so the second you leave this planet 
I can't do this. I can't breathe. We take that for granted. I can't drink water. I have to bring water with me. I have to bring food with me. So uh, everything about space is about economy of scale. So if we are running out of food and we're running out of water and uh, we're not so good on our energy consumption, the great thing about space is we have to come up with solutions. So there's nothing stopping us applying those solutions when we return back to Earth. And I think we can be smarter in our use of water and, and safer in it too. So. It's, it's billions, but on the scale of how much is invested in terms of military and, uh, you know, security and our health, I don't think it's it's a huge amount. And it and it it um, it helps us uh, think about ourselves as a species, but also it encourages us to come up with smarter solutions for the issues that we have on our own planet, and in particular about the use of our resources. Thanks very much, Neve. And we might come back to some of those uh, yeah. points that you've raised there. Theo... Dorgan is a, a writer in many formats, a storyteller, but principally he writes in poetry. He's a member of Ace Donna. He's a social commentator and he's an ocean going sailor. And uh, I wonder, Leo, do you thank God that we're surrounded by water at the, at the insular level of Ireland? As the words of the song say, thank God we're surrounded by water. How do you think that shaped us indeed as a people? You're, you're muted at the moment, Theo. This is the oddest thing, Brian, about Ireland as an island is I think most of us are in denial about the fact that we are in fact <laughs> surrounded by water and that we are in fact an island. I think in the Irish mind, there's a, a sense that there's some kind of nebulous bridge from Belfast across to Scotland and from Dublin across to Liverpool. We don't really complete the circle of water around Ireland. But the implications, I mean, if, if you just start with the, 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 say, for instance, the social political implications, um, you know, we came from somewhere. There was nobody here until the last ice age began to retreat. We are all of us, all act Irish people are incomers. We came in off the sea. And I think that's the first thing we have to remember. And the alleged first poem in Ireland written by Amergeen, who came over from Galicia. And I would imagine... Um, brought here by Phoenician traders who'd been trading bronze out of Alahis, that, that arc from Alahis across the Tremor all through the Bronze Age. Uh, you know, we, we've always had, we've always been settled from the sea, successive waves of incomers have come off the sea, and yet somehow the idea that we're in our, an island hasn't really taken root here. And that was one of the first things that came home to me when I started to voyage a long way away from land. Um, the next thing that occurs to me in terms of being is that the great American ecologist and supreme poet Gary Snyder has um, the idea of um, ter naturally defined territories for people to manage and live in. And of course, the, my, my idea of a, an, an all-Ireland economy, an all-Ireland polity, is in fact because the island is a natural bioregion. We have a common agriculture, a common geology, common seas. It's a manageable place on the face of the earth to live and a great deal of that is to do with the fact of being an island but I want to go back to, to something Neve said that photograph of Earthrise taken by um oh what was his name Anders William Anders in 1968 on Apollo 8 the big lesson I think that my generation took from that is that there is no planet b this is what we have I think by extension we thought of this planet water, which is where we live, um, it's, we, we think of it uh, by analogy as a spaceship. This is all we have, all of the resources we're going to have for millennia to come. I don't, I'm not hugely optimistic about what is to be garnered from space exploration in the near future, which I would define as 10 generations. Um, what we have is all we have. The, is all the rare mineral earths, all the water, where all the arable land that we're ever going to have. So the first lesson of that extraordinary earth rise photograph is conservation. Yeah, we have, sure and we have to do so. Like no one is. Deirdre Crow, Deirdre Crow, Deirdre Crow, Deirdre Crow. Thank you, Deirdre Crow. Go on, Theo. And yeah, and you know, long ocean voyages of the kind I've made, I've made a few, um, bring 
this home, all you have to keep you alive is what's on the boat, allowing for having a water maker if you're very rich and very fancy, which I never, we never were. Um, all you have is what you have. So you teach, you have to think as a conservator and you have to think of your environment with absolute respect. It is not, it is only a provisional given, you know? If we poison it, if we overuse it, we don't have it anymore. It goes away, it does not come back. And so I think this is what thinking of, if we think of ourselves as living on planet water, it makes us much more aware of how fragile our ecosystem in fact is, how fragile our, our planet is, how unlikely our planet is. Given in the near cosmos, there are so few habitable planets compared for us, when God only knows what other kinds of creatures or beings inhabit those planets, but for our carbon-based life forms, um, we are in a very fragile situation. And I, I think that, you know, when we think of ourselves purely as earthbound, we miss the fragility of it. It's not so obvious, but when you switch it and you see ourselves as living on planet water, that really emphasizes uh, that we have finite resources and we have a fragile hold on the planet. The great thing about being deep sea is anything can happen. You cannot, you can provide as best you can, but you're at the mercy of enormous forces. I think going around our towns, our cities, our villages, our farms, our hillsides, we don't have that same sense. We have a sense of security, which is in some ways illusory. Water strips that away. Deep water certainly strips that away. Uh, can I just go back to an early, earlier point about your response to the notion of being, thank God we're surrounded by water. I mean, if we're thanking God for something uh, there, then it is that we're separated from our nearest neighbor. But as you rightly point out, in fact, we live as if we are able to walk into their back from in from their backyard. And in fact, but, we do. Uh, we, and, do and we do. That's the, extra, that, the extraordinary thing is the planet. It. I remember once we were sailing a boat, we sailed a boat down to Nazare in Portugal, down to Biscay, five days from Kinsale, right up to the 19th century in the advent of weeks to two months to two years to make that journey. I said we sailed a boat from Iceland to Dublin, eight days, right? That's all it took for the Viking raiders to come and steal women from Ireland and bring them home as concubines to Iceland and give us 37% of mitochondrial DNA in the Icelandic population. Until very recently, until first the railways, then the internal combustion engine, then airplanes, by far the most efficient and quickest way of connecting to the rest of the world was by sea. And we've forgotten that. You know, five days to Galicia, that's all, that's all the Phoenician traders who came here for, for copper, which they, which they put together with tin from Cornwall in armories on the west coast of Sicily for the, you know, the ultimate weaponry of the late Bronze Age in the Mediterranean. But five days from Galicia to Ireland with favorable winds. That's a lot closer. Yeah, you're other. making, you're, you've, made, you've anticipated the point that I was about to get to uh, or put to you, which is that water is a means of connection as much as it is a means of separation. Absolutely. And historically yeah. was probably a prince, the uh, most efficient means of communication was by sea. It's stunning what early voyagers were able to do uh, on very small boats. Uh, let's let's move on. We'll come back uh, to some of those things. Um, Susan Hegarty is a geographer with special interests in landscape and apparently in the southeast of Ireland landscape. That's where I am at the moment is in the southeast and mineral resources. And she's the head of School of History and Geography in DCU. And she's been leading citizen science projects on uh, water quality monitoring. And hundreds of people have been involved in these. Uh, Susan gathering data on water quality, what's your sense, what sense do you get from that about how people relate to our water resources? Well, Brian, I think that in, for Irish people and for people living on the island of Ireland, water is intimately linked to landscape. And I think I agree with what uh, Niamh and uh, Theo have been saying that we forget uh, at times that we are an island and we just see water as part of this landscape, uh, land being the operative word here. Um, but that that we particularly, I think, um, particularly it's been shown during COVID that we desire to be near water, whether that water is on a stream, on a river, somewhere that we want to be there because it soothes us. It's part of our, it is part of our makeup. 
you know, we are mostly water. We need that that link. Um, and from what we've seen with working with citizen science um, or citizen scientists ac across the country, working with the regional groups, with local groups, is that they want to protect that landscape. And one way, one very concrete way to protect that landscape is to protect the water that is running through that landscape because it is something precious. Um, as you said, Brian, I'm a geographer, um, and some of you might remember back when you might have done uh, inter-search or junior search or leaving search geography, and you were handed an ordnance survey map, and you were told why is the is the town or the or the city located on a particular area, and you always were told look for the water, look for the river, and you know there is a river running through it in order to get water supply, in order to get um to in order to be able to transport people. We need that water. We need we need to live near water. And so I think that that is inbuilt within us, not only in this country, but in other countries as well. Um, and we we want to protect it. But I, I think as well, uh, yes. sorry, go on, Brian. Oh, no, you just took me back to my school days. Or, uh, uh, there was a question in an exam about uh, why Sydney had become so important. And I went through all of the reasons why Sydney had become so important to do water. And I had it totally misplaced on the map of Australia. But uh, that, that's another story. Um, sorry, I stopped you, Susan. No, no. Um, no, I was just going to say that I think that as well, um, we, most of us, and it's really interesting listening to Theo and Neve, most of us have a relationship with water in some way. Um, and I think that that relationship, whether it is, you know, as a kid being brought to the beach or as a kid going down to the local stream and falling in inevitably, which you do as a kid, um, that visceral uh, relationship with water is really important to us and it, it brings us to a place um, and we want, therefore, to be able to protect it in some way. When you uh, were asked to respond to the notion of when I think about water, this is what I think about, you referred to uh, the effect of water on the soul, which mm -hmm. is uh, an interesting kind of affective relationship, even spiritual relationship. Uh, is, is, is it very important to you? Is, is water and the contemplation of water and the con contact with water very important to you personally uh, and philosophically even? I, personally, absolutely. Um like uh like theo um you know i also have i've well i don't know if like theo but i grew up um on cork harbor um i've sailed like theo for you know a lot of my life um and so being in the water and being on the water for me personally is where i find peace um and just to see that vastness and i think you've mentioned the humbling effect that you know looking at at the creation has at you know at the uh, in, enormity of space the enormity of of what, what is out there um and realizing that this is is so much bigger than us and that we have only a finite amount of this and so we need to protect it and that for me is that relationship that i have with with nature and with the environment and that's why for me i'm quite passionate about trying to protect this and i try to get that across to as many people as i can Auric larkin uh former director deputy director general of the environmental protection agency uh after the epa park was active in a, a eu joint programming initiative on water which talks about addressing water challenges in a changing world and uses the banner water for all, talking about addressing water insecurity. Ori, can you give us a flavor of the kinds of issues and challenges that are being uh, talked about in that context of cooperation between nations? What are the big, what are the big headline issues there? Well, uh, uh, I suppose they're similar in most countries, really, when, when you get down to it, uh, as everyone has said, we all know how important water is. Water is vital for all of us. We can survive without food for a month or so, but we wouldn't survive for a week without water. And, uh, and so it is literally vital for, for, for everybody to have access to water to drink. And uh, if, it's, if it's clean and wholesome, well, then you're lucky because uh, a growing number of people, indeed, you know, with the population growth uh, um, globally, a, glo a, a, a very large number of people, close to a billion, do not have such access 
and we take it for granted, I think, in many countries when we turn on the tap or flush the toilet, uh, that the, the clean water comes in tapped from somewhere and the, and the flushed water goes away somewhere and, and most people don't think about it anymore. Um, so on, on at what was happening, uh, I, I, was, I, was, I had left the EPA for a number of years before I was asked to, to co-chair uh, the Water JPI and indeed, uh, Fiona knows more, more about the Water JPI now than I do because she, I, I hope she's still involved uh, at some level there. The, the, um, the idea was that countries were spending money on water research in their own kind of little silos, if you like, and indeed they're, spend, they're, they're spending money on research in all kinds of areas. And uh, the Council of Europe, the member states, decided that they would try to get cooperation uh, for what they call big societal challenges like water, climate change, antimicrobial resistance, uh, aging population. I know there's about 10 of them. So water was one of them. And I, I ended up uh, helping to chair that at times. The kind of things that were, were uh, the big, I suppose, things were, first of all, water quantity and, and, and particularly the variation now with the global climate change problem, which is, which is manifest all over the place. And, and, um, and so, you know, we saw what happened, I think, was it, was it in Brisbane last week or the week before, where they, where they got, I think, I think they almost got a year's rain in three days. Uh, these things are happening more and more and you're going to get droughts as well. And, and the consequent problems that has for infrastructure, for making sure that there's water to go around. So quantity is one thing and dealing with those kind of extremes. The second thing is, uh, is chemicals that we never dreamt about before. When I started off my work in, in Forest Farborough back in the, in, the, in the early 70s, uh, the mid, mid 70s, we were worried about BOD and suspended solids, and that was about it, and the pH. And, and, uh, and that's about all we did. Started to do a small bit of nutrient uh, monitoring then, nitrates and phosphates, as farmers moved away from making hay and making, making silage and spreading loads of the fertilizer. And, and, uh, but there, there was no mention of antimicrobial resistance, for example, or you know, other weird and wonderful chemicals that are made at a fantastic rate. Every, every week, every month, there's new and weird, wonderful molecules being produced at industrial scale. And, and, and all of them end up uh, sooner or later in, in, in the wastewater. So the big question for scientists, I suppose, and for environmentalists is what constitutes harm? And indeed, I, I had that question often asked when, when I was in the EPA as a regulator. And I see Michal Kanej is there online. Michal probably has had the same experience. To know, it, it's difficult to know uh, what, 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 is, what poses a risk to human health and to the environment. It, it's not always clear. Uh, and trying to, to uh, reach a balance between what can be allowed and what should not be allowed is, is not always easy. So the idea of the water JPI really was to try to get the countries to cooperate on their environmental spend. And it was a big amount of money when you added all the countries up. There's about 20 odd countries now in the water JPI. And if you could define, at least get the heads together and brainstorm what are the big issues and come up with this sort of a strategic research agenda that says, these are the important things. Uh, this is what we'll do first. Let's break it up between our, between the different parts, and I'll do one bit, and you do the other bit, rather than having people uh, inventing the wheel in different places and the same wheel. Uh, and uh, and by and large, it started to be. I think I think it, it was a success. It, it it it's moving to other areas now, like knowledge hubs, which are again getting experts who are you know in a particular area to put their heads together uh, to make sure that you know they're sharing data they're sharing infrastructure uh, and that they um, they won't be duplication really so that's the idea of the water jpi but i'm just going just just going back for a second on what was said uh, very eloquently by the other speakers uh, i i remember that earth shot uh, very clearly uh, and and um, 
it, it is a wonderful photograph and lots of people have it in posters on their wall. Um, it, it does show you the fragility of our little planet. Uh, and, and like a lot of that water that you see, most of it is salty. The fresh water bits are locked up in polarized caps and like a very, very, very small, I think it's like, like zero, zero, seven percent or whatever is available for us to survive on. And uh, considering that, you know, I'm mostly water, my brain is 70 something percent water and I think mostly it feels like mush, but, the, but uh, all of you are in, in, the, in the 70 percent as well. Um, it, it's very important that, uh, that we look after it and protect the little, the little tiny bit that we use. Thanks, Porik. Um, Fiona, have you seen any uh, questions coming in or comments coming in that uh, we might pick up at this point? No, not yet, not yet, but I would urge people to come in. Um, I, I think the, the comments that Neve is making, the controversial comments, I suppose, around the budgets um, for, for um, exploration versus health, um, and I suppose in the context of understanding our, our very small planet is uh, one, you know, I, I would think that people kind of would uh, wake up to. It's a, it's a very interesting point um, and important one. Um, and, and Theo's perspective on, you know, the importance of water. I go back to a comment I was chatting to a, a friend uh, the other day about John Millington Singh and him writing about Riders to the Sea and how you know, most people left and didn't come back, uh, but we us usually just had fish on Fridays. So we're we're really in a different place now in relation to water and our love of, of water, the way beautiful way that Susan has 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 put it. So I'd urge people to stick in their comments there and, um, you know, try and, uh, you know, really test these people who have thought deeply about this topic, but nothing yet. Neve, can I take you from the planetary to the molecular? Yeah. I wonder, uh, as a, a very imaginative person with a scientific background, you could mm. imagine how to present, how to represent the idea of two atoms of hydrogen combining with one of oxygen, or is it the other way around? Uh, two, two of hydrogen combining with one of oxygen. One oxygen. And I know you know about atoms because I still have a box of really? atoms. Wow. I, I can't really show it with this virtual Put it in screen, front of your chest. Have, Put it in front there of you. There you go. Oh, my God. That's a Brian, box of that's atoms. I, uh, Neve gave me that box of atoms and everybody else who attended the show of hers in 2011. Wow. Uh, and <laughs> as far as I know, it's the same atoms still in the box <laughs> that you gave them. Um, anyway, uh, wow. I think it might, it might be something you'd think about. Just how, how would you get this? I mean, extraordinary thing that we have called water with the most simple uh, chemical structure imaginable. How, how well, would you actually represent I, that for people? I'm, yeah. I probably talk about the sun, really, you know, and um, when you were asking me that, I was kind of going, what is he asking me? You know, so I, I had a good think. And of course, you know, everything starts with stars, you know, so the early, the early beginnings of our universe you know, I'll briefly tell the story because it'll put it'll put where water comes to, from in context. So we're our sun is a second generation star. So what had to happen was there was a whole load of stars billions of years ago, and um, they're factories for energy, for want of a better word. They squeeze. They start by squeezing and pulling together by the force of gravity, hydrogen atoms. And then when there's no room left for the hydrogen atoms, what happens is they split open and they fuse and they form helium. And that's what turned the stars on. And that's what gives us this great light. And then helium got squeezed. And when helium got squeezed, then we got the, the next element, which was carbon. And on and on and on it went until we got to the um, until we got to the element iron. And it doesn't happen with iron. So eventually that star died and then it exploded and went supernova. And in that supernova, we got gold and vanadium and all the, the silver and all the beautiful precious metals that we have on our planet. And then it started again and, you know, the hydrogen started to coalesce. And but at this time, there was junk in the air at the same time. And from that, we had the formation of our star and then all this junk around it, which formed all these planets. And because of this explosion that went supernova, we had additional compounds and elements. And some of them made gold and vanadium and some of them made oxygen. So that's the very early beginnings of, of hydrogen and oxygen. Why they ended 
end up forming a relationship, I don't know. I always think of the periodic table of elements as the perfect uh, treatise on, on human relations and, and chemistry. And why is it that we're attracted to certain kinds of people? And it's always down to, I always think it's always down to those alkali metals and um, you know the inert gases and they're all different personality types. So the inert gases I think are people that are perfectly happy on their own. Um, the most passionate relationships are the people with group one and group seven. So that's why sodium and chloride are, are so tempestuous and, and yet so solid when they form. And then you've kind of got the people in the middle that sort of, you know, they're happy to, um, you know, that they're happy to to kind of have many relationships in their lives. And then you have these unique relationships between hydrogen and oxygen, where you have this very weak bond, hydrogen bonding that forms this relationship between oxygen and hydrogen. And yet it is such a fundamental um, uh, element uh, in our whole existence. And it's exactly what Porik said, we're mostly made up of water. And so, you know, on a, on a molecular level, it seems like such a delicate relationship between oxygen and and um, and hydrogen and yet and yet it has created this unique um unique element uh, water as far as i know is the only um, element there is that when it solidifies it actually floats on top of itself so its solid form is actually you know less dense than its liquid form uh, we have water vapor and and all of these different forms um, form this triple point at which it can exist in all three parts. It can be vapor, water and ice all at the same time. So it has all these different characteristics that are very different from other elements when they freeze and when they sublime. And so water is essentially um, sublime. And, uh, you know, it's 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 sort of inherent in, in everything that we are. And as, as Theo and, and Susan and Porik already identified from their own unique perspectives, we all go back to the same thing, that it is this resource which is incredibly precious, precious and yet abundant in some forms on our planet, but we cannot drink it in those forms. We can only drink it when it is pure and without the presence of salt. So uh, like Theo said, there is no planet, there is no plan B or there is no planet B. So um, we really do have to protect and preserve this resource. And I'll say one other thing, what really switched me on to this was spending 15 days in a desert in Utah, pretending that I was living on Mars. And for the first time ever having to count and um, account for our water usage. We had two plastic vats of, I think it was 200, uh, 200 liters in each of those vats. We had to make that last for 15 days. And we could only flush the toilet for number twos and not number ones. And every time we used the water, there was this really useless pump that would make this sound. Oh, 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 oh. And so I learned that if I if there was five splats, I could wash my hands. Two splats would be enough for, you know, when a splat is a uh, sound of the motor. And I started counting my my water usage based on that motor splats. And so I came back to Earth. 15 days later and it's never left me my water consumption and and when you have something in limited supply then and only then do you really value it so I don't know if everybody needs to go and live in the desert for 15 days to to realize how valuable our resource is but it certainly affected me well some people went to live in the desert for 40 days I think uh, but water right now, water yeah. <laughs> Water is sublime. It's a lovely idea. Uh, water is obviously has been invested with huge significance uh, by poets and painters and others, but noted be by religions. And so this week we're remembering St. Patrick and all around the country of St. Patrick's Wells. Uh, how do you understand that, uh, Theo, uh, that, that, that huge significance attached to water uh, in terms of ritual and, uh, and and indeed in terms of poetry and and art, other arts. You're mute. You're mute, Theo. Muted. Um, now, Neve used the word sublime, and I think there is there is a deep root in us that recognizes the sublime that bows before the sublime, that embraces the sublime. And even though I know you're using in a strictly chemical 
term, or chemistry term, as a chemistry <laughs> term. It, it got there for a reason. It got into the vocabulary of chemistry for a reason. I think we feel the sublime power of water because water is process, transmutation, water is never still. We see it life, we see fish move through it, we see all forms of aquatic life move across it and through it. And we're drawn to water. We're drawn. Just, just imagine, um, you know, walking in the countryside and you come to a, a brook running downhill, maybe through rocks, you know, maybe a, a, something, a, a mountain ash hanging over it. And you stop entranced and time goes by and literally entranced. I think water draws us because it's so intrinsic to our natures. Um, and our natural instinct is, whether you're in the desert or at sea, is to conserve water. You know, it, it, that's not just simply practical. It's also, I think, recognition of the, the sacral nature of water, that it is a treasure. I think we are framed to understand that water is treasure. Um, you know, Susan will tell you that, I mean, you know, one of the great crimes you can commit on board a boat is to do the dishes under a running tap. You get balled at for doing that, you know, because so, yeah, you have a finite amount on board. And, you know, enormous detailed studies have been done on just how much water, say, a solo sailor on the trans Vap, for instance, needs to carry the minimum. And questions about water and, and human life are always to do with minima, not maxima. Um, if we look at the, the sad history of hunger striking in Irish political history, you can go, as we know, a long time without food, but no time at all without water. So for all of those reasons, we're framed to understand that water, I think, speaks to the imagination because it speaks of process, transmutation, forms of alchemy of the soul, alchemy of the heart and mind and body. Um, we're aware of that. Some of that is rooted in the deep memory of the amniotic fluid, of washing around in the amniotic fluid, hearing the first rhythms of art, your mother's heartbeat. So it comes back into the body. I think the, the best of what we've made as makers, whether as scientists or as artists, um, do with two things, is to do with fluidity and it's to do with rhythm, whether it's visual rhythms or oral rhythms, whatever. But fluidity is also important. And water is our first and most important experience of the fluid nature of things. You never know what's going to come up. In fact, I was thinking, um, of, of, of a poem I wrote some year um, that, that just recently actually it'll be in a new book. It's to do with um, the experience, the, the suddenly being lifted into a cosmic perspective simply by being on water. Do you want to? Would you, would you suffer a poem, Brian? All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Where did I? Where did I put it? Oh yes, here it is. I'm direction home with a little nod to Bob Dylan fans. Somewhere south of Finister, he lies down on the foredeck, hands laced comfortably under his neck. He is watching the stars power past when a quick flick in the neurons, a soft shock in the solar plexus, has his neck hairs bristling, his spine electric. He is looking down, pinned to the spinning globe by the delicious, the unconsidered power of gravity. And it's an attempt to capture something that happened to me once going down to Biscay. We, we, we think, because we're earthbound, that we're looking up at the stars and suddenly realizing there is no up or down. There is only out. So you might, it makes as much sense to say, and I felt that shock in the body, that I was looking down by gravity. And that was the only, this invisible, unexplainable part is the only thing stopping me from spinning off out there through an atmosphere that is largely water, incidentally, into deep space. So we have, this is a perspective that leads me back to, you know, water is held here. Water is held on this spinning globe as it spins in the halls of space by gravity, another inexplicable and mysterious, or as inexplicable as the terrifying simplicity of two hydrogen, one oxygen. That bond. That tiny bond, those insignificant chemical, omnipresent chemicals, that's all is keeping us going. These tiny, tiny things, and yet the impact. I mean, it's really important to think about what we are putting into water. I mean, you're, you're right. It's the chemicals, the proliferation of extraordinary molecular bonds of whose long-term effects we know nothing, nothing at all. 
I'm old enough to remember when they, they built a, a, a contraceptive plant in Ennis, the amount of estrogen, estrogenization of the male population of County Clare due to discharges from the factory into the water. You remember that, Brian. We were, we were young around then, you know. I, th I think I even remember the name of the company. It began with S, Sy Syntex or something like that. Yeah. Syntex, yes. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. There are all these guys who are mysteriously, you know, on the bar stools of Venice with secondary sexual characteristics proliferating. Yeah. Well, I'm, I haven't spent we don't much time know. in Venice. I clearly, I clearly missed something. I haven't spent much time in Venice. <laughs> well, I live in Venice now, so it's very important to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love an optimist. That particular plant is being uh, dismantled as we speak, literally dismantled. They're taking it all down, and uh, and I think it's it's going to China or somewhere. But just on spinning, reminded me there, Theo, you know, that uh, like those those electrons are spinning. And when you look at the, you know, I mean, the most atoms we know are empty space, but those electrons around the around the H two O, you know. Two of them spend a little bit of time. It's the covalent bond, and this is from my chemistry of many, many years ago. It means that the electrons basically work for both atoms. They they spend a while at the oxygen, then they spend a while at the two hydrogens, but they they spend they spend more time on one end than the other, and that makes the the molecule polar. So a bit it's like a little mini magnet. One end of it is kind of positive, one end of it is a little bit negative, and and so it then attaches to a nearby water water molecule. Uh, in a sort of a tetrahedral type structure, and that's that's what that's what allows it uh, to freeze from the top down. If we, if we had lakes or rivers that, that froze from the bottom up, well then you know we'd, we'd have we'd have big trouble uh, for for everything that lives in there. But uh, it, I think it is unique uh, uh, in in that aspect that as it begins to, as the as the atoms begin to get closer, the molecules get closer and closer together. That hydrogen bond kind of just just pushes them apart enough. Say, no, don't come any closer. If we're going to be solid, we're going to be solid, but at a distance from each other. And, and that allows, that allows the, the density to be less than, than, than the liquid form, the solid density, and so it floats. Uh, and, uh, and if it wasn't for that, then I think we wouldn't have life at all. I, I was just looking at the question, uh, somebody, I think Michal asked a question about, about the importance of, of, um, of was it eco? Was it ecosystems or uh, nature and climate? Nature, nature and climate. And, and I, I was reading recently about the life cycle of the pearl mussel and 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 how the, the pearl mussel that lives for so long in the cleanest of environments, and we still locally have a few spots around the, around the country where they where they live, but they live so long that they're not that pushed about reproduction, you know, because if they do it once or twice in the hundred years, then 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 they're all right. But like the, the, the tiny little, little eggs of the pearl mussel attach themselves to the gills of passing fish. And they hitch a ride basically. And they live there for quite a while before they decide I'm big enough now, I can, I can fall off this, this gill. But that's how they get upstream uh, because they're, 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 otherwise they'd be washed down. And I mean, how long it took for that to evolve in a water environment, for that, uh, for, for that ability, is just mind-boggling to me. A lot of mind-boggling indeed. Uh, Susan, can I just switch a little bit uh, to political and social matters? You've situated some of your work in relation to the sustainable development goal of clean water and sanitation for everybody. Uh, how can we address the massive inequities in access to clean water? on a global scale. Is it a political matter? Is it an engineering matter or is it something else? I think it's a bit of everything, but I think that, um, like I, I don't think there's any quick fix. If there were, we would have solved this already. But I think one of the issues that we have, and again, it's going back to that thing of water is precious. We only have a certain amount of it on the planet. We, it, it can't get any more um, and we need to allow to make people aware of that and so every small little bit that we do affects the whole um and so the, like i keep going you know with with everybody that i speak to about this is we go back to okay we've got a certain amount if we take it out of the system we need to purify it to get it back into the system because otherwise 
we can't keep taking out infinitely. So if any of us takes it out of the system, it needs to be put back. Um, so it's again going back to the question that, that um, and the comments that a couple of um, Theo and Niamh have made, you know, we only have a finite amount of this, what do we do with it? Um, at an individual level. So do we really need to be using water that we that has been purified to drinking water standards to do everything around the house? Um, it goes beyond, you know, turning off the tap when you're brushing your teeth. But, you know, do we, you know, what are we using for our plants? Are, can we use um, water that we've already used um, to wash the wear to water something else to wash the car? It's those little things which they may seem small and they may seem, but sure, I'm not doing anything to address the inequities of water in another place. But actually, if we think that all, we're all in this together, each little drop of water that I save, that I conserve, actually has it has an effect elsewhere in the planet because we only have a certain amount of it. So my little bit of water here actually is important, as is important to somebody somewhere else as well. Um, and I think that we do need to get that across and also to see this in in the whole, because we we are living, each of us are living within a catchment. Um, so what we deal with, what we do with the water in our little area upstream will eventually affect the water that goes down to the sea, will eventually get into the ocean and that has consequences. So I think that it is about changing perceptions, um, changing what people understand with water, understanding that water that's coming from your tap is important to the water that's going in the stream that you are you know the water that you're contemplating in that brook that's going on um, through the mountains what you're doing at home affects that water um, and so it is about engagement it's about getting that message across to people i think thank you we're, we're approaching the end of the uh, so we've gone very quickly. Um, Fiona, would you just say a couple of words about uh, World Water Day, which takes place, uh, which happens on this day week, and you've got some events happening in connection with that. Yes, we do. Thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, World Water Day is a bit like our, our St. Patrick's Day for the Water Institute. Um, it's a celebration day. Um, it's uh, a UN... Um, day annually on March 22nd and usually there's a theme and this year the theme is groundwater um, which is very apt because again we've talked about you know um, appreciating the finite resource well what's under the ground is, is even harder to appreciate in some cases so uh, on World Water Day on, on March 22nd this year we will have a series of online events uh, we'll have lots of events happening around the campus but a series of online events um, we have a Eurochem um, presentation where we actually talk about chemicals in the water, a topic that's come up a couple of times here, which is something that is really important, um, you know, understanding the, the chemical cocktail in the water. And then we also have a speaker from Colorado, uh, Will Sarney, who really has established a campaign uh, because the Colorado River has dried up. And he himself is a businessman. Uh, his area of interest is water digitalization, but he's going to talk to us about, uh, you know, working together to, to understand how we can manage water better. But he understands, you talked, uh, you talked about me of being in, the, in Utah. Uh, well, uh, Will understands also what it's like to be in the desert and to see the river drying up, which is actually really quite stark. So those are two major events that we have, which we're really excited about. But there's lots of other things. A lot is happening online, uh, but there's lots of other things happening around the campus. And as I say, it's a really important day for us. Uh, we go a bit crazy on social media just to build awareness. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a really important day, just one single day to recognize the importance of water. But Actually, within the Water Institute, we have a campaign which has been running since last um, Valentine's Day 2021, which is our Love Water campaign, which we're going to continue through our new strategy now. And it's a very simple message to just love every drop of water. Uh, so it may seem a bit corny, but it's really down to that, uh, really, you know, down to the point, you know, the looking down at the planet. I love that image that Neve had 
you know, of, of actually grounding you when you see that planet, you know, from up, up in space, that it's, it's familiar. Uh, but for me, it's about every drop of water has to be loved. So, Brian, that's what we have. We've lots of stuff going on and everyone can sign up for them. Um, and uh, also a law pro have events, Swan have events, um, and Firm Ishka have events. So there's no shortage for all you water lovers, no shortage whatsoever. Um, but to make yourself aware of what's going on uh, around the, the globe. And that's the great thing, I suppose, that COVID has given us. If there be one thing, and that is this connectivity. Um, so there you have it, Brian. Uh, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If, even before World Water Day, there is, and who knew, World's Storytelling Day. And Theo and Len Graham and Jack Lynch are marking World Storytelling Day at the Mermaid Arts Centre in Bray. So there's a mermaid in the water in Bray, uh, if you haven't uh, met her. Uh, on Saturday, is that right, Theo? Uh, or Sunday? It's on the weekend. Yeah, anyway. Friday. 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 Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, good luck with that. Um, uh, Theo, do you have uh, your poem "Art Changes All" uh, beside you? Oh yeah, and and um, if it's not very formal, I I will now hereby dedicate it to Neve Shaw. Okay, because she brought okay. it up first. It's a it's okay. another unpublished poem. It's called "Art Changes All." On December twenty fourth, nineteen sixty eight. Nuclear engineer turned astronaut William Anders changed history forever. Leveling his modified through the window of Apollo 8, compelled by beauty, he made the photograph that taught us once and for all that our Earth is all we have, our blue and shining home. Grant them the engineering miracles, the delicate technique of the camera, the triumph of lunar orbit, but then this, a man prompted by beauty, made the image, and nothing since has ever been quite the same. And I think that's, that's what water does for us. Water is beautiful, not in any sentimental way. It is water is beauty. It is perhaps one of our most pristine and perfect images of beauty. And why, why not prompted by beauty if we are to save ourselves from ourselves? I can't help noticing Tommy O'Brien keeps trying to putting his hand up and wanting to say something. Brian, I think you should invite Tommy in there. This has been um, the beginning of quite an education, and thank you all for what I've learned. Sorry, Tommy, did I did I miss you there? We we, give, we, we might even give you the last word. Am I on mute? Am I? No, you're you're. We're hearing no. you. Can hear you. Uh, well, I, I first of all, you're all very expert in your own fields, uh, senior people from the universities. I, my, mine is the University of Life. I, I, didn't, I didn't study. But uh, I was born in Port Marnock, beside the sea, so water was very much part of my life. And it was only three years ago I realised the relevance of real water when I became involved with speaking to people from Uganda, little children who, who have no water to drink, but to travel eight miles and a bucket on their head going back. So I started to, to, to probe this myself, and three years later, I'm happy to say that there, at the moment, there's seven schools in Uganda with, with a thousand children in each school will be drinking clean water out of another eight schools starting next week. So that's, well, that's well, my involvement in water. Well no, well I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this, well, I'm not clapping myself on the back, but I, 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 I did a little thing in, as an OAP in the D DCU and I got this little message. And I said, I must, I must try in the group, something to do with water. So a lot of what you said, sorry, I don't like to be the pun, it washed over my head because I'm not the intellectual that you are. <laughs> but, but I admire what you do and I know you have a serious interest in, in, in developing water to make it available to everybody in a fashion that will be sustain us because we, we need water for life. So that's a nice to Tommy. see you all. And <laughs> I might follow Tommy, up with your names. I wrote down lots of names. Tommy, thank you very much. Can I ask everybody just to put on their cameras and show your appreciation to the panelists, uh, Neve Shaw, Theo Dorgan, Susan Hegarty, and Porrick Larkin, and to Fiona for co-hosting this. Uh, to all of you for attending, thank you very, very much indeed. Goodbye, and, and you may go off and have a drink of uh, water. Water. <laughs>
Preferably uh, flavoured with Barry's tea, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Good everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Stay safe. Bye.